This video is an excerpt from a much longer Italy travel talk. To view other topics or to watch my Italy talk in its entirety, visit ricksteves.com or check out my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Enjoy. Buongiorno, thank you for joining me. I'm Rick Steves and I want to share with you a little bit about the countryside of Italy, specifically Tuscany and Umbria. When you go to Italy, you often think of Venice and Florence and Rome, and understandably so. But you need to balance that and complement that with a look at the countryside. And of course there's lots of great countryside to see in Italy, but your sort of quintessential Italian countryside, I would bet, is Tuscany and Umbria. Now a beautiful thing about Tuscany and Umbria is it's very handy. It's between Florence and Rome, it's easy to get to, and when you get to Tuscany and Umbria you've got a nice balance of sizable towns with a great pride from the Middle Ages, and you've also got charming villages and beautiful farm culture and a wine culture. The most important city in Tuscany and Umbria is Siena, and Siena is a rival of Florence. Actually Florence is in Tuscany, so I should say the most important city in Tuscany would be Florence, but that would be a major big city experience. When you're thinking of Tuscany, I'd rather make Siena my home base and my springboard, and Siena is one hour away from Florence, it's easy to get to by bus or train, and when you go to Siena, it is a perfectly preserved medieval town, almost traffic free. And I want to remind you, back in the Middle Ages, it really was neck and neck with Florence. They were arch rivals, and uh, to this day, they are rivals on the football field and so on. It's just there's a, a lot of medieval pettiness is not quite the word, but medieval attitude in Siena. And when you go to Siena, it's fun to get caught up in that because it survives to this day. They've got a great Duomo or cathedral, and if you step inside the Duomo, it's just slathered in art. And remember, when you think about the art of Siena, it hangs on to its middle-aged style a lot longer, for about a century longer than Florence. Florence abandoned the halos and the gold leaf and the pointed arches, whereas Siena kept embracing that. So this would be your Sienese art long after Florence was uh, well beyond that in the Renaissance. You've got a great couple of galleries in Siena and wonderful church museums to enjoy that kind of art. The greatest square, arguably in all of Italy, is the Campo in Siena. And when you go to the Campo, you don't find a church with a, with a spire on the main square, you find a city hall with a bell tower. Because Siena, to me, is an emblem of humanism. Siena celebrates good government, all the way back to the times when it was a proud city-state with what it considered an excellent community government. And you see that when you go inside the city hall to this day. You can climb to the top of that tower, and it has a commanding view of the town that spread out from there. Now, when you go to the, you know, the Campo, the main square, a lot of times it's just a beautiful, like a big brick beach. And you can hang out there and enjoy the sun and whatever. And then you can come back later on and bam, it's packed with people. This is the Palio. Twice a year they have an amazing, no holds barred, literally, uh, horse race, and uh, it's called the Palio, and uh, it just takes the city by storm. If you're going to go to Siena during the Palio, you really need to have reservations in advance, because you can imagine it's quite crowded. But any time of year, you can go and enjoy the drama, and, and just the, the magnificence of that square. And again, any time of year you can be there just sitting cross-legged on the bricks and come back later in the day and it'll be like this, depending on what sort of festivities going on. The Palio is just two days out of the year, but each Palio has a whole series of days before and after where you can enjoy all sorts of festivities as you have the competing neighborhoods, the Contrada, that all have their own horse and their own racers and their own pride. It's just a lot of fun to get caught up in that. Nearby is Pisa. And Pisa is famous for its square of miracles, the Leaning Tower, the Duomo, and the Baptistry. But I want to stress that Pisa was a great and important city-state in its day that competed with Siena, and it competed with Florence, and it competed with Genoa. It had its own fleet. And when you go to Pisa today, you'll find the whole town is worth exploring. I love Pisa away from the Leaning Tower. Very few people pause long enough to enjoy that part of the town. It's easy to get to by train, and within a couple of blocks of the train station you find the river, the Arno River, the same one that goes through Florence. And then beyond that, you will find the Piazza of Miracles. And the Piazza of Miracles is named that because it's one of the most dramatic 
piazzas anywhere in Italy. You've got this ensemble. Remember, in the Middle Ages, you had to have this ensemble. That was the standard center of a city. The church, the bell tower, and the baptistry. And you'll find that little trio all over the place. The difference about Pisa was they had a lousy soils engineer when they built their bell tower. Because before it was even done, it was already tilting. In fact, if you look at it from the right angle, you can actually see they, they straightened it up. So it tilts and then it goes straight at the very top. Not a very good answer to the, the problem. They've gone to great lengths to solid it up and pump out the water and pump in concrete and ever. And today they have stopped the tilt of that leaning tower. So we were all worried it was going to get to this point and fall over. But thank goodness it never did. And today you can go to the top of that tower. You can imagine there's a lot of tourists that want to do that, so when you go to Pisa, you need to make a reservation. And upon arrival, you go straight to the box office, get your name on the list, and then you get a time so you can enter the bell tower, and that gives you a chance to see the other sites on that square. Your guidebook will give you details, but from the top of the tower, which is really fun to climb up, by the way, you get a chance to survey the Piazza of Miracles from above. The Duomo, the cathedral, is a remarkable building, and arti artistically, it's the most important stop on the square, because inside, you've got a beautiful, Baptist, a beautiful um, pulpit and beautiful carvings by Pisano, the great sculptor that inspired Michelangelo Angelo from Pisa. Nearby, just half an hour away by city bus, is Luca. And in researching my guidebook chapter on Lucca last time around, I realized that there is a direct bus connection from downtown Lucca over to the Leaning Tower. And you could very reasonably consider the Leaning Tower of Pisa a sightseeing attraction of Lucca attached by this regular city bus that you could get to in about half an hour. So consider that because Lucca is a much more popular place to make a home base and call home. Luca has a beautiful downtown center with all sorts of characteristic buildings, and I find just a charming downtown without famous sites, but with a beautiful intact kind of ambiance that I really like. Most unique about Luca is it has a more modern wall. In the old days, you had tall walls that were kind of thin before there were cannon. With the advent of gunpowder and cannon and artillery, you need to have squat, fat walls. Of course, squat, fat walls is what we saw in the 1800s and the 1900s. And today, a squat, fat wall is just as worthless as a tall, skinny wall, except a squat, fat wall gives you a nice park all around the town on top. And this is a beautiful strolling opportunity, and it's a very popular bike trip. So you rent a bicycle, and then you bike around the modern wall of Luca. It's a delight, one of the highlights of your visit to that town. There are a lot of hill towns in Tuscany and Umbria, and my favorite hill town, I gotta say, if I had to choose one, would be Volterra. And Volterra is just, it's less crowded and it's less famous, that's one of the reasons I like it so much. It's kind of dark and brooding, and it has a lot of history that can be shared by local guides. One thing I try to do in my book is employ local guides by arranging with them to offer public tours to my readers. In Volterra, Annie who, and her partner, who run this little tiny tour company, will meet my readers every night at 6 o'clock. And for $20, my readers get a local friend to take them around the town for a couple of hours. It's a beautiful thing. It's beautiful for Annie because she makes a couple hundred dollars on a good night. And it's great for my tourists because for 20 bucks they get the luxury of having an expert licensed guide to show them around this great town. Tuscany, the word means Etruscan. Etruscan. This was the Etruscan civilization 500 years before Christ. And today you'll find great Etruscan museums around Tuscany. One of the very best is in Volterra. Here we have a, the lid of a sarcophagus. The Etruscans, we don't know much about them except for what we've learned from excavating their tombs. They had beautiful art on decorating their sarcophagi. And we can learn a lot about their civilization just from looking at that. Also in these towns, you'll find great artisans. This is an alabaster workshop, and you can step right in and watch the men working and buy some alabaster. Uh, you can find silversmiths uh, and enjoy their art. All over Tuscany and Umbria, you've got this chance to connect 
whether they're vintners or silversmiths or alabaster carvers, whatever, you can find that love of tradition and, and, and workmanship when you are in Tuscany and Umbria. Of course, Tuscany and Umbria are famous for their wine, and as you travel around you'll find lots of vineyards that welcome tourists. When you're going wine sightseeing in Tuscany, and you know the famous uh, Brunello di Montalcino and so on. There's all sorts of elegant and rich and, and welcoming uh, vintners, but you have to have a reservation. It's just really important. It's very easy. They'll, take, they'll get off their tractor and show you around, but they just don't want to be surprised. So in my guidebook, I've visited many of them. I've listed my favorites. It's very simple. You simply call them up a day or two in advance and say, can I come by? And they might pair you up with somebody else who's visiting or whatever. But it behooves you to take a little time to do your research, and then you meet a vintner. He takes you on a walk through the vines. He takes you into his cellar. He lets you taste the finished product. And it's an elegant look at the culture of Tuscany. Now, there are a lot of ways to fill it up for cheap when you're in Tuscany. And the Italians like their fancy wine, but they also like their filling stations. This is right outside of Orvieto, where local people bring their jugs and top up their table wine for the season. I like to spend a lot of money for a glass of wine when I'm in Tuscany. In fact, I like to try the different wines, and rather than buy a whole bottle, I would spend a, a little more of just for uh, samples and be able to understand the best that they can do. My favorite kind of restaurant is an enoteca in this area. Not a fancy restaurant, but an enoteca that serves, that opens up fine bottles of wine and serves them by the glass and matches them with beautiful local produce. That's really the, the, the goal, is to pair it well. I'm not sophisticated enough to understand all this pairing, but I am sophisticated enough to recognize it when I taste it. And when you hit the jackpot, it really is out of this world. Strive for that in your travels. Open yourself up to letting somebody who really appreciates the fine wine and the local terroir to put it together so you can have that great Tuscan experience. All over Tuscany, you can visit these great vineyards. Your towns for home bases for this might be Montalcino or Multipulciano. Two great towns. I was just there this last year researching in the guidebook. They're right up to date in the Rick Steves Italy book and in the Florence and Tuscany book, which covers that area a little more thoroughly. Multipulciano, like Montalcino and like a lot of towns in this area, have a mini square that reminds you of a two-bit Siena or a two-bit Florence because in a way they were. They were controlled by those many empires centuries ago. Uh, Montalcino is in Brunello country. You may know that Brunello di Montalcino. From the window of my hotel, you get this beautiful, beautiful view of the countryside, and that's what you explore. Beautiful churches, beautiful cypress trees, wonderful abbeys, and of course, villages and vintners. If you want to get the full dose, of that salt-of-the-earth Tuscan magic, stay in a bed and breakfast. The key is agriturismo. In Europe, they're struggling to keep their small farms viable, and what they do is they rent out rooms to make ends meet. And in Italy, a working farm gets the privilege of calling itself an agriturismo. You can't call yourself an agriturismo unless you're actually making money as a working farm. So it's a way to help subsidize them, because it's really important, the bed and breakfast uh, income that they enjoy. I've done a lot of research. It takes a lot of time to scour the countryside for these different agriturismo. And I'll tell you, when you find a good agriturismo, like Isabel's place here, it is, it is just an amazing vacation. In the case of this bed and breakfast, you stay for a week. And every day is a cultural experience as she takes you truffle hunting, and then you make your pasta, and then you go to uh, wineries, and every day is a delight. And, and when I research these places and see the tourists enjoying the swimming pool, enjoying the fine food, enjoying the rich culture, oh, I just think that's a great vacation in the countryside of Tuscany. And when I drop in on these farms, I find people, all of them have my book, but none of them knew each other before their visit. And it's one big happy family enjoying this delightful Italian cultural boot camp, okay? San Gimignano is a beloved town because of its skyline. Look at San Gimignano. It's pretty cool to have that skyline. And uh, that was not unusual 500 years ago. In the Middle Ages, Every town had its feuding noble families, each with their private armies. The Montagues and the Capulets, you know that from Romeo and Juliet. Noble families fighting each other. Clintons, Romneys, 
Gingrich's, you know, all of that, bam, bam, bam. And uh, when you got central power, the king's going to come in and say, all right, nobles, I'm tired of this. You guys aren't powerful. I'm powerful. You all got to cut off your towers. And you look at any town and you find lopped off towers. The one town that has its original skyline intact for whatever quirky reason, San Gimignano. It's a gorgeous place, but it is quite touristy. I find the charm of San Gimignano is easiest to enjoy after hours. Go there in the evening, have dinner there and spend the evening, but stay in the countryside nearby. During the middle of the day, San Gimignano is a tourist trap. After dark, it has all that magic. Orvieto is a good example of a hill town. Look at the way it fills this volcanic outcropping. Can you see the cliffs on both sides? Isn't this delightful? It's just big enough for a sizable town, and you don't need to build a stupid wall. You got one already, don't you? The cliffs. So you carve into the cliff an entryway, and you fortify the entryway, and you've got yourself a perfect pinnacle town. In fact, this is so well fortified that this was the Pope's refuge when he was under attack. He would head out to Orvieto. Today, it's about an hour and a half north of Rome, and it really is a great place to check out. Its centerpiece is this amazing cathedral. You step inside the cathedral, it's got beautiful art. This is a whole chapel painted by a guy named Signorelli, one of the most beautiful chapels in Italy. And like hill towns elsewhere, you've got a nice connection from the train, which is in the valley floor, because obviously the train's not going to go up into the hill town. When the train arrives, there's a bus waiting right across from the curb, and everybody gets off the train, onto that bus, and then up into the town. What you need to do when you come into a hill town anywhere in Italy is to remember this train is not for tourists, it's for commuters. They live up in the town. Every day they come home from the big city, they get off the train, and they don't want to hang around. They get off the train and step onto that bus, and it shuttles them right up to the city square. If you dilly-dally in the train station, there's a good chance you're going to miss your connection and have to wait for the next train for a bus to take you to the center. Do you follow me there? Or you'll have to spend a lot of money for a taxi. So take advantage of those shuttles when it comes to hill towns. One hill town that has no shuttle is Civita di Bagnoregio. And Civita di Bagnoregio is my classic hill town. I just love this place. I've been going here ever since I was a college kid. We take our groups here, and it is just the sort of textbook example of a hill town. You find a lot of these hill towns in Tuscany and Umbria. This is technically just over the border in the state of Lazio but it's near Orvieto, which is in Umbria, so you think of it in terms of Orvieto. And when we go up that donkey path, we are leaving the 21st century. And to wander through this town is just an amazing thing. The main square, unfortunately, it's a dead town now. The last residents have died, and it is people from the big city moving in and having countryside escapes and making their bruschetta and selling it to tourists. So it doesn't have the living culture that it's had a generation ago, but you still have that charm and that rustic lifestyle in the countryside of Italy. Nearby is Assisi. And Assisi is famous for this guy, St. Francis. St. Francis, the uh, amazing uh, founder of the Franciscan order, and uh, when he died, they made this incredible basilica for his bones, his relics, and he was made a saint within a couple of years of his death. Uh, very, very fast, unprecedented in, in, in uh, Roman Catholic sort of uh, terms. And to d for centuries, tourists and pilgrims have come to Assisi to honor St. Francis. Uh, when you look at the architecture around this uh, church, you can see it was meant to accommodate hordes of pilgrims. In the Middle Ages, it wasn't tourists, it was pilgrims that put this place on the map. The main drag from the town down to the basilica was the Pilgrim's Way. And there'd be all sorts of hostels along the way, and little rustic restaurants and so on. And to this day, it accommodates travelers in a beautiful way. I love Assisi. It's got the beautiful Franciscan heritage, and it's also got a chance for you just to hike up to the ruined castle, enjoy the same bird song that inspired St. Francis so many centuries ago, have a picnic and celebrate this beautiful, beautiful, sort of special atmosphere in Assisi, where, where, where it's famous for a gathering, interfaith gatherings. They go to Assisi because it's got this beautiful love thy neighbor kind of uh, vibe. And even if you're just a, a flash in the pan Francis fan, zipping through on your tour, it's a beautiful opportunity to take a moment, read up on St. Francis, take a little walk, and, and try to get into the spirit of St. Francis. Down in the valley floor, you can find the little fixer-upper church that he and his partners uh, renovated, and that's where the Franciscan order was founded. And down there, you can see that church today in the middle, underneath a huge dome, 
of a giant church where all the pilgrims go and remember St. Francis. When you're going to Italy, you're going to go to the big cities, Venice, Florence, and Rome, and so on. Make time for the countryside and the most popular countryside destinations in Italy, understandably so, are in Umbria and Tuscany. Thank you very much. If you've enjoyed this video, you'll find lots more at ricksteves.com and on my Rick Steves YouTube channel. Happy travels and thanks for joining us.